catching a game in all 30 pro ballparks and walking away with a home run ball. Check. Whatever you're getting ready for, come into Supercuts. Supercut stylists pay attention to every detail so you get the haircut you want. And with our signature hot towel finish, you'll walk out feeling clean, sharp, and not just ready, but super ready. Supercuts. Save time by checking in with our mobile app or at supercuts.com. Radio listeners, this is Gunnar Monson, and I am one of your hosts of Monster X Radio, as well as the founder of the Sasquatch Coffee Company. Sasquatch Coffee, have you tried it yet? Go to www.squatchcoffee.com to get yours today. And I would encourage our, our listeners to check out our new website at www.monsterxradio.com. Um, you can uh, subscribe there and get the latest updates. Uh, we'll send you an email when new shows are available, and uh, we're going to be having a uh, cool contest. Uh, in fact, uh, I wanted to congratulate our first contest winner who won a pound of delicious micro-roasted Sasquatch coffee, and that was Bobby Shirley. So, Bobby, congratulations. Uh, like I, I mentioned earlier today, your coffee is freshly roasted and will be on the way actually tomorrow. So look for that um, in a few days. With me today, as always, is my good friend and uh, consummate Bigfoot researcher is Mr. Shane Hardcore Corson. Shane, how are you? Uh, oh, Gunnar, doing well. Uh, glad to be here and looking forward to our uh, distinguished guest uh, today. Me too. I'm I, I'm excited to talk about. I like I like history of of uh, Bigfoot. If you're into Bigfoot, you like to read everything that has to do to the the subject. And uh, um, I'm sure he is uh, well versed in in uh, all the mythology about it and and uh, the history and stuff. So I'm mm-hmm. I'm excited to talk talk with him today. Yes, likewise. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a, a a, a fascinating show. I've never had the chance to talk with our guest, but I have listened to him on, uh, he has done a few other uh, blog shows uh, and, 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 and excuse me, uh, he's spoken at a few other uh, conferences, so he's, he's very uh, very fascinating. Um, I think I'm just going to go right into the uh, introduction of us today. Uh, our guest today is Professor David Floyd, uh, professor of English at Charleston Southern University, where he teaches British fiction. He earned his PhD from the University of Stirling, Scotland, which is funny because that's not too far away from where I was born in Glasgow. Uh, but uh, uh, other than that, uh, uh, David is uh, an author of the book Street Urchins, Psychopaths, and Degenerates, uh, Orphans of the Late Victorian and Edwardian Fiction, work on medieval, Gothic, and Victorian literature, and has presented at conferences in England, Scotland, and the U.S., uh, he is currently pursuing a second Ph.D. in psychology through the University of Hyzinski. I may pronounce that wrong. David has spoken uh, at the Ohio Bigfoot Conference and last year's Virginia Bigfoot Conference, and he will be uh, speaking this year, 2017, at the International Bigfoot Conference where Gunnar Mawson and myself have both been speakers. It is a fantastic event. Uh, and I'm, I will be attending this year, and I encourage those of you that have 
have attended and are looking to attend the International Bigfoot Conference, uh, I encourage you to attend this event. Uh, I know, like I said, uh, uh, David Floyd, our, our guest today, will be speaking, and uh, it will just be a great event. So please look into it uh, up in the beginning of September. Uh, Gunner, I am going to bring on uh, Professor David Floyd. Great. Hello, David. Hello, how are you guys doing today? Doing great. I'm doing, doing great. well. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for the invite. I appreciate it. I want to make sure. Can you guys hear me okay? I sound great. You now. You say okay, yeah. fine. I um, I'm in my man cave in the garage, and I uh, just <laughs> want to make sure all this metal wasn't stopping the um, the uh, reception. So uh, just let me know if you have trouble hearing me, and I'll go out to the car or something. Um, okay. But anyway, yeah, um, you guys doing all right today? Doing, doing well, well and uh, yeah, doing well and and it's a it's a privilege to have you on the show. I've listened to uh, you were interviewed on a few times on Sasquatch and uh, right. fascinating yep. fa- yeah fascinating stuff. Uh, do you mind, uh, David, telling us just you know I'll give you a brief introduction. Do you mind just telling us about yourself? Uh, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, well, one of the frequent questions I get is, how does an English professor become interested in Bigfoot? And um, it sort of works the other way around. I think I've always been interested in Bigfoot and cryptozoology and just paranormal stuff, anything that's sort of mysterious and anything that sort of reminds us that there's more out there uh, for us to explore. And um, so I've, I've always sort of had an interest in this, um, but had never really pursued it in an academic way. You know, I never really... Um, you know, researched it and all. Um, My area of specialization in English is um, genre fiction of the late Victorian period. So this is um, genre fiction in British literature of the late 1800s. And what that, what I mean by genre fiction is things like Gothic fiction, stuff like um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Dracula, um, Early, early science fiction, stuff like H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, uh, stuff like that. Um, Ghost stories uh, really got going during that period. Um, There's adventure literature, stuff like uh, Treasure Island and um, uh, King Solomon's Mines, which a lot of people haven't heard of, but which went on to greatly influence the creation of the Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, films. Um, You've got detective fiction uh, like Sherlock Holmes, comes about during this period. And then you've got imperial fiction, uh, stuff like Heart of Darkness, um, which, again, people might not necessarily have heard of, but went on to inspire a little film called Apocalypse Now, and um, which also clearly influenced the recent Kong Skull Island um, film. So the point of all this is that the fiction that I look at from that period all has to do with mysteries and monsters and just kind of strange things. And so that's, I was sort of embedded in that, you know, in working on my, my PhD and all that. And when I was done with that PhD, you know, and, and like with any um, project that takes a while uh, that you work on for years and years, <clears throat> uh, afterwards you just kind of like, what do I do now, you know? And uh, just yesterday I went to see a play that um, some of my students were putting on and I talked to one of the girls afterwards and she said, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. We've been working on this for like a year, you know. And so that's sort of how I felt after I finished my degree. And so I was kind of looking around. I'm one of those guys that has to have an end zone to get to, you know, and just a carrot in front of me. And so I started looking around for another sort of research project. And research is really my my thing. That's where I I really enjoy going to the library and and all that, just consummate nerd, I guess. And um, so I started looking into just monsters in general and really got this interest in how monsters – were depicted in in literature and sort of how they've been perceived throughout history. And I, I sort of started looking at this timeline and just different things started popping out at me. Uh, you know, if you have something like, like in the medieval period, like literally a thousand years ago where you've got works like Beowulf that most of us are introduced to in, in high school, but you know, where you've got Grendel is the monster that comes in and starts killing the soldiers at night. So Beowulf fights him and kills him and kills his mother and then fights a dragon. Um, And then later on you have 
stuff like the trolls in Lord of the Rings, you know, and in these stories, the monster is, is clearly evil and it just needs to be killed and that's it. And there's not really a possibility of conversion or anything like that. But then if you fast forward to something like Victorian monsters, like the stuff that I've, that I specialize in the literature there, the monsters are used to sort of articulate these kind of cultural concerns uh, that are, that are about during that period. And they sort of, they're used as, I guess, um, ways to, to reconcile some of the cultural problems that were going on at that time. But then you fast forward to like today and you've got films like something like Hotel Transylvania where the abnormal is celebrated and the, the monster is um, revered, you know, and just this, this sort of change in uh, how monsters are kind of depicted and how they're perceived and, and that type of thing. So that was kind of the trajectory of my research at that point. And just for whatever reason, at the same time, this kind of dovetailed with a, a renewed interest in, in Bigfoot. And um, I started looking at uh, a couple of people like um, Bernard Hoeblemans, Ho um, who wrote On the Track of Unknown Animals in 1958. Um, he was one of the first cryptozoologists, and he talked about cryptozoology needed to be interdisciplinary, and not just science, but to look at at art and art history and folklore and all this. Um, and then you have somebody like Ivan Sanderson, who uh, was a contemporary of Hoeglman's. Um He wrote Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life in 1961. Um, he was known to research uh, medieval texts and look for stories about wild men or um, you know, monstrous creatures and all that. And both of these guys had the idea that, that these ancient stories had some kind of truth to them. Um, and then you've got a couple of people um, lately, um, scientists of today writing in the history of science and all, who, who say that they're not really sure if there's a Bigfoot, but this thing is so prevalent that there must be some kind of biological reality to it. And so that sort of solidified, I think, the trajectory my research was going in as far as, you know, I, I thought, well, I'll take this idea, this, these this idea of mysteries and monsters that I'm interested in and the idea that I like to do research and I love watching documentaries about Bigfoot and stuff like that. I'll just kind of combine these and see what I can come up with. And so I sort of put together this kind of timeline of different incidences of Bigfoot type creatures. They're not, I'm not saying they're necessarily all Bigfoot, but the, the, the main thesis or the argument of my research was that there, there's consistent enough the appearance of hairy man-like creatures in the forest um, going all the way back to ancient Greece that this, this thing is consistent enough, I think, to consider that there may be some kind of biological reality to it. And so I um, started looking around. I love going to conferences. I go to a lot of literature conferences and present and that type of thing. And I started looking up conferences about monsters and stuff, just kind of see if I could kind of throw a paper together and see and um, I got in touch with Mark DeWerth of the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. This was back in 2015. And um, I was invited to come speak there. Um, and that was great because I was able to meet uh, Seth Breedlove and Mark Matsky uh, that do SASWAT. Um, and they've had me, I think, three different times I've been on there. Um, I got to meet Lauren Coleman, who's a big world, big name in the cryptozoological world, of course. Uh, John Kirk, um, Bob Gimlin. That uh, was nice. Uh, Jim Sherman, if if you know who he is, he was uh, actually my roommate <laughs> and, at the uh, conference. And um, that was just a great experience because I, I I was not previously, you know, really into that world. I didn't know, you know I'd never been to a Bigfoot conference or anything and um, just jumped in with both feet and just really loved that, that culture and that subculture and the, that Bigfoot world. Um, and then in 2016, as you mentioned, um, I was at the Virginia Bigfoot Conference uh, that Billy Willard put on, and um, we got to meet uh, Joe Gizondi, uh, who wrote Monster Trek. Um, if you're familiar with that, it's a really interesting book. Um, Bill Dranginis um, had a really interesting story of his encounter and all. Um, Russell Easterbrooks, uh, who's actually speaking at the, the one this year, too. Um, he and I were both invited back, so I guess we did something right. <laughs> but um, but anyhow, so that's that's sort of how I got into 
this world at the at the point I'm in um, now. I um in August, if things work out right, I'll be going to to London. Um, I'll be speaking at the Interdisciplinary Research Foundation there, uh, but that's more about like psychology and literature, um, not so much Bigfoot or monsters and stuff. But um, still kind of cool, cool to go to London. Um, and then in September, um, Labor Day weekend, first uh, through third, is the International Bigfoot Conference that I heard you guys say that you had spoken at before. And um, and then there's Virginia Bigfoot coming up in October. I think it's sixth through ninth, and uh, so so that's kind of my background, I guess, or how I got to be where I am now. <laughs> well, thank you, for, Professor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. So um, it's uh, it's funny because you mentioned Beowulf, and that popped into my head as one of the the pieces of literature that that uh, even when I was a kid and, and reading that in high school, that that uh, character reminded me of a Bigfoot type of creature, so yeah, it really does. Um there's um there's mention in the text that it has um that Grendel has scales, which disappointed me because I wanted right. to think of it as a Bigfoot too. But I right. I think of it more as a, a lizard man maybe. <laughs> so I could still get the cryptozoology angle in there, yeah. Um <laughs> But it's yeah, very much. If you if you see any um, editions with Grendel on the cover, it always looks like a Bigfoot. It's big and hairy, right? And maybe carrying right. a skull or something like that. Um, but uh, that's definitely a. Uh, and and the thing is that story, even though it was the first time it was actually written down, it's the first it, it's the first text in English that we have written down, or what is old English, what became our language now. But what that comes from is these old Germanic tales that were handed down orally for years and years and years. And so you can tell that there's, there's a prevalence of that type of, you know, this maybe hairy or scaly man-like creature coming into the civilized area to cause problems, you know, back before people were even, were even writing things down, you know, and that just again goes back to that idea of just that consistent figure showing up over and over again, you know, Shane, did you? I think we lost Shane for a little bit. Shane, are you back with us? It, it sounds like we <laughs> still have not. Yeah, uh, Blog Talk gotcha. is famous for uh, for dropping us sometimes during the <laughs> middle of a show. So, gotcha. um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to pull my weight, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you've been doing a great job so far, <laughs> Professor. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, please. When it comes to some of the of the supernatural or paranormal reports, historically speaking, uh, have do you see them growing in number? You know, or, or or are there less of them, or is it state pretty consistent? As far as as being, Bigfoot being more than just this biological creature, you mean? Um, because it, it, it seems like, yeah, it seems like. There, there may be several camps going on in the Bigfoot world. I think there, there's some who are just Bigfoot is is just a an animal, maybe man-like animal, walking around the woods, and that's you know it's just a biological reality kind of thing. Um, and uh, you know I think in a lot of ways the the Bigfoot people want to stay away from the UFO people, and the UFO people want to stay away from the the Bigfoot people. Um, but uh, it does seem like um, I think with I'd say lately, you know, over the last 20 years or so, there's there's more of an acceptance of saying something like, hey, I believe in ghosts or I believe in UFOs or I, I believe in Bigfoot or I've seen a Bigfoot. You know, it, it doesn't have that negative stigma as much, I think, as it used to. Um, so I think the the entertaining the idea that these worlds could kind of cross and um, and there could, you know, if, if there's a – it's um, Stan Gordon, I believe, that does um, that has done a lot of reports about the appearance of UFOs and then the subsequent appearance of Bigfoot along with that. Um, it's really interesting, you know, and I, I'm open-minded and and you know consider the possible anything possible, you know. <laughs> um, so I don't I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that the um, I think the acceptance of sort of um, alternate views of reality is um, is more prevalent these days. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and, you know, and, I, I, and I've seen that as well. 
Yeah. Um, and it's it's interesting to me because having come into it originally thinking that this is just an animal out there and it's something undiscovered and, you know, eventually somebody will, you know, will document it successfully and all. The the thought that it might be connected with something more sort of supernatural or paranormal is, it's, it's interesting at least. I, I haven't done any research into that, you know, I've, I mean, other than seeing a video or, you know, or a documentary or something. Um, so it's, it's certainly a sort of, for me, it's kind of an untapped aspect of this, um, but who knows? I think that one of the, the appealing things about this topic is there are so many sort of unanswered questions that it can kind of go in any direction you you want it to, <laughs> or or mm-hmm. any you know you can entertain a lot of different possibilities. So um, so then that's that's fun. I think maybe frustrating Part for a lot of, yeah. of people. But it's it's fun for me. <laughs> And, and some of what you talk about, it always Bigfooting sometimes reminds me of Ghostbusters, where you're not supposed to cross the streams. You know, there's a different. <laughs> everybody seems to have an interest in all these different, like mysterious things, but you're not supposed to ever cross them. Which, and I, and I'm, I'm I would describe myself as a hardcore aper. You know, I think that we're dealing with yeah. a biological entity that that is terrestrial in origin and. Um, and terrestrial based. <laughs> so yeah, I tend um, to be that way myself. So mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh you know, guys, I am back. Uh, sorry about my little departure. Uh I guess the <laughs> men in black <laughs> men in black did not like my, my partaking next of this question. episode. But, yes. Yeah, next question. <laughs> <laughs> I was just hoping you weren't you... abducted by aliens. Not yet. Or if I was I don't remember. <laughs> so uh, Yeah. Oh there you go. But to kind of go on with, with the last line of questioning, uh, you know, aside from the supernatural part, David, have you what have you noticed doing all your your lengthy research and study of this phenomenon? What have you have you noticed any similarities throughout the the his, you know in, in history historically speaking? Uh, any similarities? I mean, what led you to really uh, you know you uh, mentioned I think on one of your other uh, podcasts you know that. Uh, with your research, you know, your belief is that there is, you know, there's substance to this being a biological reality behind the counter right. reports. Uh, so, you know, have, having looked at you know, many reports and, and historical stories and, and on this phenomena, have you found any similarities, uh, any consistency to these uh, reports and, and stories throughout history? Absolutely. Um, and it's, that's, that's sort of what I, I started when I, I was sort of looking at this sort of timeline of just monsters in general. Uh, it's Bigfoot type stuff kind of jumped out at me. And um, I, again, I'm, I'm not reading Bigfoot into everything, but I'm just kind of noticing when there's some hairy primate or large giant hairy man type thing, uh, you know, crops up. Um, so if you go all the way back to sort of ancient Greece, and and you know my my research tends to look at the Western world, so we're talking about like Europe and North America, um, but this stuff is certainly prevalent in the Eastern world too. I'm just not, but there's just so much world you can cover. Um, but there definitely, you know, there's Eastern versions of this. But if you if you look into, you know, ancient Greece and Rome, um, some of the uh, literature talks about wild men, um, and in our Greek mythology, there are these two characters, um, Agrios and Oreos, if I'm saying those right, there are these sort of half bear, half human giants uh, whose names mean wild one or savage one and um, mountain man. So that's kind of neat. Um, there is uh, Pliny the Elder was a, a um, during the, around the sixth century or so, I, I might have that wrong. But uh, he was a historian that um, wrote about all these things he saw in travels. Um, you know, this talks about these this monkey-like tribe in India um, and these forest people. This is really a, this is a direct quote from him: uh, "Forest people with hairy faces." Um, yeah, it's it's pretty neat. And then when you get into the the medieval period, which is you know roughly a thousand years ago, uh, like I was saying earlier, you have Be- the story of Beowulf comes up. <clears throat> where you have this sort of man beast come from beyond civilization 
And um, and again, this is based on Germanic tales that would have preceded, long preceded what we have um, written down today. So that idea of this sort of wild man out there, um, you've got a lot of um, sculpture during that period of, of wild men in, in churches and um, paintings and that type of thing. Um, Leif Erikson of the Vikings around the nine, late 19 or late 900s um, talks about uh, these huge hairy men that lived in the woods and they smelled bad and um, they would shriek at night. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, giving some given some of these descriptions, it sounds like they're talking about a Bigfoot, you know. Um, and even into the 1500s, and especially around, you know, into the 15 and 1600s when Europeans started to, to really travel a lot, um, you start getting reports of, you know, these hairy men and um, this one, this guy um, that sailed with Magellan named Antonio Pigafetta, um, who talks about these giants with huge feet and uh, bull-like voices uh, in Patagonia. Um, and then when you get into, you know, the 1700s into the 1800s and you start having, you know, all these accounts in the New World, um, there's accounts in the French and Indian War of seeing these wild men, you know, in the forest. And once you get to, like, colonial America, once the Europeans really start going through and uh, kind of settling and all, um, and, of course, they're running into Native American stories of the, the hairy man, you know, because they already had their own whole belief system set on on the hairy man. Um, but you can just go through all these, you know, from the 1700s and on. Um, you know, I've got this this list of um, this the tribesmen in Delaware warned the, the European settlers about this wild man that lived out in the woods. Um, there's attacks from wild men um, and seeing these wild men or hairy men in the swamps in Georgia and Texas and Arkansas and Oklahoma and uh, there was wild men of the woods in Tennessee um, and definitely out in once they got in, into the Pacific Northwest into the 1800s um, that that the um, British Columbia that area uh, the name that the Indians had for that area actually is translates to the place of the wild men um, there was an artist named uh, Paul Kane uh, in the 1800s um, who painted a lot in that in the area of Mount St. Helens and all. Um, he talks about this race of beings that uh, live out in the in the um, woods and they kind of keep to themselves, but the the Native Americans respect them and they don't mess with them, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and then once you have you know newspapers and the publishing of words and, and that type of thing. Uh, you have all these uh, newspaper accounts of, you know, wild men in the woods or hairy men or, or whatever you want to call them, uh, Bigfoot type things. Um, and then on into the, you know, the 20th century where you, you start having, you know, sort of the more modern study of this kind of stuff. And then you have Shipton and the Yeti tracks. Um, you know, you have, I mentioned Ivan Sanderson and, Bernard Hoibelmans, and then you have John Green, and then you have the, you know, and Rene de Hinden, and then the um, Patterson Gimlin film, and you know, just all the way up to to today, you know. And so if you, yeah. you know, even if you go back, like I said, all the way to to ancient Greece, that that figure is there consistently, and it's my mm-hmm. thought that because it shows up over and over again, um, and it's it's a consistent thing. It's this wild man thing that lives in the woods. Um, and that typically has big feet, smells bad, and yells a lot, and and, <laughs> and that you you don't want to mess with it type of thing. And some of them are peaceful, some of them are not. If you um, if you look at the um, hairy man um, accounts of the Native Americans, <coughs> excuse me, there's um there's sort of two categories. One of them is a um, this peaceful type, and he's just sort of antisocial. He they they have their own culture. Uh, some of them even use tools and all. Um, in some cases, they would even trade with um, the Native Americans, but they're very specific. It's not just another tribe. These are they're hairy giants um, who look very different, 
Um, but they're called sort of the guardians of the forest, and they're, they're supposed to have this sort of supernatural ability to, if you see one, you kind of go into this trance, and, and then they disappear type of thing. And, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people today, you know, say they, they see one and they just kind of freeze, you know, or they start just kind of crying and they, they don't know what to do with themselves. And, uh, you know, that seems to be similar to what the Native Americans are saying about this particular type. They, they just kind of freeze you and then they disappear sort of thing. Um, and then you've got this more aggressive type um, that they call it, like the stick people. Uh, there's one, there's a ton of names, but um, this one's more confrontational and violent, um, rumored to be uh, cannibalistic, and rumored to be uh, fond of kidnapping. So, um that's a very there's, so there's sort of two different, I guess tribes or species, whatever you want to call them. Both seem to have the commonality of being you know hairy giants, um, but one is peaceful and one was not. And um, just to show sort of the, the prevalence of this type of thing, I talked about the the aggressive types being known for kidnapping. You know, they come in at night and not only steal your fish or whatever you had, but they might also take your uh, your child. Um, but if you look at some of the other cultures, uh, the Western cultures, there's um, in Bavaria, there's this uh, figure called Fenge, if I'm saying that correctly, um, who would also come in and, and kidnap uh, women and children at night. Um, in Vienna, there's you might have heard of the Krampus. There was a movie about two years ago, I guess, called The Krampus um, about this mm -hmm. sort of anti-Santa Claus type creature. Um, that's, that's from... Um, Germany and Switzerland and some of those areas, um, this uh, creature that comes in and, you know, if Santa Claus will just give you a bag of coal uh, or a piece of coal if you're bad, the Krampus will kidnap you and take you away <laughs> and wrap yeah. you in chains, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's this other guy from uh, Spain called the the, um, the Sack Man that comes in and takes bad children and puts them in this bag on his back. And one of the, I forgot to mention, one of the um, attributes of the the hairy man that kidnaps is that they have a, a basket on their back uh, that they put the kids in. And so that seems to be this kind of convention associated with this type of story um, is the wild man or the, the Krampus or the, the figure that comes in with a sort of bag or a basket or something that um, takes the children. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> excuse me. In uh, British Columbia, that's that's uh, I know, uh, you know parts of British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest that that was a, a, a you know a theme uh, in a lot of the stories and artwork. Uh, but you know it's really fascinating that to me that like you mentioned historically speaking throughout different parts of the world, uh, you know you got the same description, the same attributes to uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot. It's, uh, fascinating to me, and it, it, it I get a little perturbed that with all of the likeliness of the stories, all the similarities that uh, science hasn't taken any closer look at this, uh, you know, one of the, one of the uh, attributes or, or things that, you know, uh, has been reported over time is that Sasquatch is elusive, you know, and, and I believe it to be elusive, uh, you know, and, and that's, you know, just one of the many things that, um, that uh, goes along with the description of Sasquatch. Oh, why, in your opinion, do you think uh, you know you've done an in-depth look at you know this and 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 have your own ideas and opinions? But why do you think science, uh, you know, academia as, as a whole, has not taken a, ser a more uh, serious uh, look at this subject? I, I so since I'm not a scientist, I hate to speak for the scientific community, but my thought yeah. is that scientists probably tend to prefer to study things that they sort of know are going to to happen or things that are, are easy to predict. Um, and not to be cynical, but I imagine it's a, it's a monetary thing. You know, you get funding if you are producing results. And so it's, you know, a lot of times you, you might have scientists who want to study things that they, they sort of know how that experiment's going to work out because then they have a successful um, result and then they can receive their funding, you know, whereas, you know, and unless you are, uh, you know, somebody really brave like um, Dr. Meldrum or um, Bindernagel or um, uh, Grover Krantz was, you know, these these guys that they kind of go for it anyway, you know, and um, 
and all that. But I, I would imagine, you know, obviously, you know, it's it's the exception that's going to sort of take that leap of faith and study something that that may not pan out. You know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So I, I imagine that might be it. Um, I don't know. It's it's frustrating to me that, you know, at least not so much in the last fifteen or twenty years, I think, but. Um, just the that if you say something like Bigfoot, you don't know if somebody's going to be like, oh, that's cool, I watched that show, blah blah blah, or if they're going to be like, are you kidding me? What are you messing around with that for? It's like you know, and I I don't understand why that's I don't I I don't know why people think that's goofy, you know. And I will say that it's I, I don't that but big studying Bigfoot is not like my my only research and all that I do um, because I do research into psychology and obviously Mm -hmm. teaching Victorian literature, I I keep an eye on that too, but anybody that I work with that has found out about my doing these uh, conferences and that type of thing um, has been really interested in it and really supportive and you know, not one of them has said, oh that's so silly why are you wasting your time Um, so I think there's a there's a common interest in it, even if somebody may initially laugh about it. I think we all sort of have this uh, inclination to, if not necessarily believe in it, then to think that wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be neat to think that that's possible, you know? Um, yeah. And I think that, I think that's why it continues despite the fact that there's not, you know, a body or, or whatever, um, that it, it appeals to many people. Um, yeah, so it sounds like, sorry, but so, I mean, so you've not had, you know, uh, I mean, how have your direct, the, your peers, you know, treated you directly? Uh, it sounds like, uh, you know, you've not had it too bad. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, and there was even one one um, conference that I applied for funding um, to to pay for the flight there. And the only question I got was there's, there's a committee that determines, you know, whether you get funding or not, you know, and I've never had trouble before because I, I go to the UK about once a, once a year, uh, but um, for conferences and all, but um, the, there's a committee and the, all the different disciplines are represented on that committee. And the only question I got was from some of those on the, I think they were biology professors wondering <laughs> what my, what angle was I going for here, you know? And I explained to him, you know, I'm I'm not trying to scientifically prove this exists or not. I'm I'm not a scientist. I can't do that. But I'm going from the sort of literary folklore, cultural history aspect. And um and they were like, oh, okay, cool. And then I was, you know, I was approved. <laughs> but uh, that was that's the only just, just so long as you don't actually think the thing's real. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. So long as it's just a story, we're okay with that, but not All right. Not the idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's but, exactly um, what I, who I would expect would raise the most issues with with the fellow. Yeah, and I, you fellow. know, I I understood that. Sure. Um, you know, but then I when I, once I explained that I wasn't trying to hone in on their territory, <laughs> you know. Um, but another thing, this this is not really on topic, but it's um it's another recent thing that I've looked into uh, that was interesting. We were talking a minute ago about these historical um, incidences of this creature type, you know, I think. Uh, but it, I've recently been looking into just sort of folklore and how it functions and what it is and sort of the study of it. And I started running across figures like like trolls and goblins and ogres and these things that, that show up in these stories. And again, I'm not reading Bigfoot into this necessarily, but some of the similarities between these figures um, is pretty striking. Um, you, um, like trolls, for instance, uh, they're known to kidnap children, um, and they they're notably um, anti-Christian, and they will tend to throw rocks at um, at Christianity. I mean, at churches, and I, I point that out just because. Bigfoots are known to, you know, throw rocks. Um, yeah. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. The the similarity of the, you know, kidnapping and the throwing the rocks. Um, the uh, as far as ogres, there, the uh, description of ogres tends to be large, um, hairy. They tend to smell Smelling. bad. Um, they, 
they tend to inhabit um, forests and mountains, uh, tend to be kind of destructive. Um, goblins kind of cropped up too in this. They're, they're not so much um, Bigfoot type. They're more of a spiritual type of thing, whereas trolls and ogres were seen more as like bio, bio, biological mm-hmm. beings. Uh, but goblins um, also, when they do appear, um, tend to be human-like and hairy, uh, which I thought was interesting. I, also, another kind of interesting thing that's completely irrelevant, but you run into all these little tidbits when you do this kind of um, stuff. Um, trolls and goblins particularly are averse to, to iron. And so I started looking at it. I was like, mm-hmm. why would they be repelled by iron? And I thought, well, maybe it's a, it's the idea of, you know, men use iron to build things, and it sort of represents civilization and structure and order and all, whereas these creatures are known for, like, chaos and that type of thing. And it led me to realize that if – I don't know if you're like me, but my grandmother had an inverted horseshoe above her kitchen door, and I always ah, wondered yeah. what that was. And that was to keep goblins away. Uh, not I mean, That's not why she put it there, but that's where that tradition <laughs> comes from. Uh, is it keeps the goblins uh, away. Um, I thought that was kind of cool. Fascinating. Not necessarily relevant, but still cool. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's that's interesting. I did not know that, uh, so it's, now I do. Uh, but the, yeah, with some the, of these... Oh, go ahead, Dave. Uh, uh, just, uh, just some of the things that you find out when you do research into this kind of stuff, is it's really interesting. It's a fun world to live yeah. in. Yeah, and speaking of that, you know, we research... Are any of these, you know, like the goblins and, and trolls, are they considered, any of them can considered territorial? You know, sometimes with, with Sasquatch reports, you, you see behavior, you hear about this behavior, uh, you know, being kind of territorial. Where in history, were goblins or trolls or any of these entities, were they considered to be territorial at times? So this is really interesting. So trolls tend to inhabit like mountains and forests and that type of thing. And they they tend to look like the geographical space that they are in. So a forest troll is going to look like wood, and a cave troll is going to look like they're made of stone, uh, which is really interesting stuff. Um, they don't come into the civilized place. It's people usually wander into their area, and that's when trouble begins. You know, but you don't have a troll showing up in downtown Charleston walking. <laughs> they they tend to <laughs> stay in their area. But again, if you if you try to build a church where they are, they're going to throw rocks at it, you know, and that type of thing. Um, ah. But interesting, the so the the trolls and the ogres are the ones that you know kind of hang out in the in the mountains in the forest, and they will they'll mess with you, you know. Um, but the goblin is interesting because they they come into the home, and they don't have um, they they don't live in family units. Uh, they tend to be solitary, but they will come into your home and kind of mess it up, and, and they, you know, will trip people or spill things over while you're sleeping and that type of thing. And one of the – I don't know if you've heard the, the term hobgoblin before. Yes. But the tro- the uh, goblin will attach itself to part of the house in, in these stories, and the, an old term for the hearth or the fireplace was the hob. And so a hobgoblin was a goblin that attached himself to the hearth, and he would live like near the fireplace, and he would, um, you know, scatter your ashes and stuff while you weren't looking and, and that type of thing. Um, so, so of those three, the the trolls and the ogres tend to kind of stay in their area, and yes, they are territorial and will throw things at you or eat you. Uh, whereas uh-huh. the goblin is known for sort of coming into, to the. Um, the domestic space and kind of messing it up. So. Wow, that's truly uh, that's the, the similarity to you know with these different entities uh, to to Bigfoot. It's it's kind of uncanny in a lot of ways. It reminds me. It of, really you know, is. Throw, it is. You know, it reminds me of the you know 1924 Eight Canyon. You know, Fred Beckins thing where they're throwing stuff and yeah. you know they built this cabin there and then you got bam. It's so similar. It's crazy. Yeah, and I you know I wonder how many sort of so I have this idea that you know you've got. Well, I have sort of two two theories, and I don't know how well they go together, but this is this is my thought that you have the possibility of Cro-Magnon and and Neanderthal man coexisting with modern humans at least up to a certain point. And you know, if you've got 
these sort of human-like but hairier, not quite primate, but somewhere in between, you know, looking at you from the forest, I can see how that would very easily give rise to stories about things like trolls and ogres. Um, not so much goblins, because that's more of a spirit, uh, spiritual thing, uh, supernatural thing. But I, I wonder about that. Um, but then the idea of, like, Neanderthal giving rise to these stories and all doesn't really account for things like, you know, nine-foot giants that weigh 700 pounds. Uh, so that's more along the lines of maybe Gigantopithecus still hanging around. Um, but at any rate, I, I do believe that the the consistency of these things, there's there's something around, something hanging out there <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's um, making this, you know, a consistent thing, you know. What, what, so. You know, as far as, you know, recent, uh, recent reports, you know, 20th century, recent reports, encounters, uh, are, are there any that you that stick out in your mind? Any first-hand accounts or anything like that that you, you'd like to share? Uh, just ones that that I think are interesting. Yes, yeah. Just you think are okay. interesting? Uh, that, you know, uh, having done some research on them or just read them. Well, this this is not so much an encounter as it is just again. You know, I, I find the weirdest things that don't necessarily ever come up in conversation unless I'm on something like this so I can share it. So this is, um, when I was doing this um, uh, psychology paper on Adolf Hitler, and so it was more like into his psychological makeup and that type of thing, which is a whole different podcast. But <laughs> one of the things that he was very interested in was the occult and the supernatural and all this kind of stuff. And he had this um, this group called the Anunnabek, which is this – sort of task force to go look into occult and supernatural stuff. And he actually sent, uh, there's a zoologist he sent named Ernst Schaefer, um, that he sent to find the Yeti in Tibet. And um, I, I thought that was really interesting because his whole idea, Hitler's whole idea was that the, the Yeti is a descendant of the Aryan race that lived in Atlantis. And he had all this, these ideas about this, but um, that you had the, this sort of perfect race, human race that lived in, of giants that lived in Atlantis. And when Atlantis sank, um, they were dispersed, you know, throughout the world. And the Yeti, evidently, according to Hitler, um, is a descendant of that. So he wanted to find this creature and, I guess, investigate it and see what its connections to um, Nazis were. Um, that's the weirdest thing I've found. I think. <laughs> and and just because I did not expect it at all, I was not looking for Bigfoot or any of that stuff um, when I was researching for that. And so I I found that and thought, well, I'll just kind of stick that in my back pocket. If it ever comes up, uh -huh. I'll throw it into the conversation. And here it is. The, <laughs> wow. The opportunity yeah. for completely useless information. But. Um, <laughs> It, it may seem useless, but, like, like, you know, gun, yeah, gun, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, Hitler's connection to the Yeti and some of that. So there's all these little oh, yeah. tidbits that just, you know, uh, you know, may or may not mean something, but they're there regardless. Right. Um, so I, um, I'm trying to think. The, um, the Osman case I always thought was kind of interesting, um, just the, that claims that, you know, he was camping and a Bigfoot mm -hmm. grabbed him up and took him to its lair to kind of hang out with him and its family for a while. Um, I, I don't have any reason not to believe him. Um, he seemed to go to his deathbed, you know, maintaining that yeah. that was true. Um, that's interesting just in the idea of, of these things like living in family units, you know. Um, yeah. And, and you know one of the right, and one of his um or one of the interesting aspects about um uh, the Patterson Gimlin film was um the question of why would this thing walk out in the open like that um and there's the theory that this was a mother uh that had you know a young one somewhere nearby, and she wanted to sort of draw attention away from it. Um, you know, to draw yeah. Patterson and Gimlin's uh, attention away from her young 
and so that's why she's like walking out in the open, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, another aspect. This is off topic, sort of, but um, one of the really interesting things about the Patterson Gimlin film that I did not know, um, but when I went to the Ohio Bigfoot Conference, Bob Gimlin was there and he spoke and all, and he um, he actually said that he saw others in the woods uh, while they were at that spot. Um, so it was not just Patty, uh, but that does give an indication, you know, that maybe maybe the husband was hanging out up there too, or the kids or whatever, you know, but that he actually saw others besides her. She's just the one that was on the film. Um, so I thought that was just that whole idea of the, the family unit, you know, just lends itself to the, the sort of, um, I don't know if vulnerability is the right word, but just the idea that this, these are not just things that run around throwing rocks at people or stealing children or something, you know, that it's, if, if there is sort of a, family unit you know that's that's a real interesting thing yeah yeah and that would have to be to some degree there'd be some social structure you know i mean just like there is with gorillas and monkeys and other known animals so yeah in order to yeah shane i'm sorry i cut you off go ahead Oh, no, you're fine i was i was going to get into you know we're kind of getting close to the end of the show here but i wanted to talk with uh, david about uh the upcoming International Bigfoot Conference put on by Russell yeah. Accord. I you know right. it, uh, it's a fantastic event. I was uh, talking about this at the beginning of the show. I'm so happy uh, you're going to be speaking there because it's been a, it's been a blast talking to this, uh, this evening. But what exactly um, are you going to be talking about at the conference? Uh, you know, I, I'm really interested. So probably a, a sort of nuanced version of um, of this sort of timeline of well, one of two things, I guess. One is sort of a, a more focused version of this kind of timeline of Bigfoot throughout history. Um, but at the same time, I'm also interested in sort of swamp creatures and Bigfoots of the swamp, not not necessarily limited to, to Bigfoot, but um, like the skunk ape or the falcon monster, but also like lizard man and some of, and I think it's because South Carolina and North Carolina are sort of known for these sort of swampy type creatures, you know? So that's, that's, I, I might save that one for the Virginia Bigfoot uh, conference, but the, um, at the international one, I believe I'm going to go more into the sort of connection between the hairy man and the green man and the wild man and the, and even bring in the trolls, ogres and goblins and, sort of my my whole thesis being that there's a, a biological reality to this stuff. Uh, so it's not just me telling stories about, you know, things that happened a thousand years ago, but to connect it with, um, you know, with some science. Because you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. I know Russell um, yeah. is, is very much sort of a scientific, uh, his conference is more of a scientific bent, and so, um, so I want to try to include that and kind of bring all this to where it's not just floating out in folklore and literature, but just show that there's um, indication that there is some um, scientific biological reality to it. So, um, gotcha. so that's sort of what's no, going on. And I'm looking forward to that because I, Lyle Blackburn will be there this year. I've, I've never met him, uh, but I've followed his stuff uh, for quite a while, and um, I'm interested in in meeting him, um, Adam Davies is going to be there, um, whom I've seen on all these documentaries and never um, met him before. Um, <laughs> Jeff Meldrum will be there, um, so that'll be yep. cool to meet him. So, That's um, funny because I sat between Jeff and, and Adam on stage last year during the oh, speakers <laughs> Q and A. Yeah, <laughs> Adam's a great guy, and I mean, I he's a kick in the pants. So, and Cliff Barrettman will be there this year too. Yep. He, yeah, he was there last year. He actually uh, stepped in. They, there were some folks that couldn't make it because of health and weather issues, and, and uh, uh, Russell reached out to Cliff, and he, he did a presentation, as well as uh, Bob Gimlin did a couple of presentations. So nice. um, it was yeah. a great conference, and, and um, they uh, I, I did want to also mention Ed Brown and and uh, Lori uh, uh um, Kelly Accord as well. Sorry, that's uh, mixing up my yeah. uh, Accord people. But uh, they all 
work together to put that conference on. And uh, last year was their first year of doing it, and and they did an absolutely fantastic job. And uh, we were honored. Shane and I were honored to to have the opportunity to speak. Um, and that yeah I, will be be again uh, Labor Day weekend this year, and it's in Kennewick, Washington. So if you uh, can go, you can look it up online. They've got a, a website, uh, internationalbigfootconference.com. And uh, that's a really nice website too. It's, yeah, it's really and they, well, and they well are, done. They are doing a great job. It's a um, yeah. I, I've, I've, I've heard, heard nothing from, but good stuff about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's been great, and, so. and I feel very honored to be able to go. So, and I'm 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 fascinated because I'm looking forward. One of the things that I appreciate is they they add some speakers. You know, like like yourself that that isn't. Not everybody gets the opportunity to to uh, listen to you present. So um, I like the different uh, way that they're going about with folks that that uh, and especially on the the West Coast here, we have not uh, had the opportunity to to uh, listen to your presentation, and it sounds like a great one. So, well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's it's exciting stuff, and it's um it's one of those things that. I started with it and the ball just kept rolling, you know, and it's, um, it's opened up, it's opened me up to a lot of um, good relationships with people uh, that I would never have known otherwise, or that I might just know through watching a documentary or listening to a podcast, you know, to get to meet these people in person is, is a completely different component to it that, um, Mm -hmm. that I really appreciate. You know, I feel very blessed to, to have met a lot of these folks, you know, there's the Bigfoot's been very good to me. Uh, been a better, kind of, better on a real personal me. level, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Bigfoot would have been a bear, bear, and that ate, that's I'm dating myself right there. That's old Saturday Night Live. So, <laughs> well, well, David, I I appreciate you joining us here today. So we're just about out of time. Um, we would well, love to have you, you so back. It's not, um, you're one of those guests that uh, we can talk to for hours and hours, and uh, uh, it's just like. I, the, the whole reason that I, you know, do Monster X, and I'm sure the same for Shane, is I just love talking about the subject. And uh, it, sitting down with you, uh, I get caught up in listening. And, and Shane was doing such a good job of of uh, interviewing, and your responses were so so uh, uh, intriguing. So uh, uh, it, well, you it's can, just as fun. We'd love to have you back. Well, I would. I'd be honored to to be back on. And I, you can tell that you guys enjoy what you do. Um, because I, yeah. I have I've listened to you guys before uh, Julie got in touch with me about being on the show, um, and I just I enjoy uh, what you guys do a lot. So, but so thank you. I, I, what an honor to to get to finally talk to you. I look forward to getting to meet you one day. Yeah, we'll see, we'll definitely see you at the uh, in September. So uh, great. That's so I, I uh, folks, that's all about all the time we have for. I'd like to uh, again thank our guest, Professor. Excuse me, I'm I'm choking here. Just a sec. I'm gonna mute myself. Well, I'll go ahead and close up the show. Uh David Floyd, thank you so much for joining us this evening and we uh do hope to have you back on soon. It's been very very intriguing talking with you. Very interesting. I've learned uh, a few things tonight, and I'm sure our audience has as well. So thanks again for joining us, and we'll we'll definitely get you back on the show. Great to be with you. Thanks a lot, man. All right. Thank you. Have a great evening. And Take care. Uh, thank you. Monstrous listeners, hope you guys enjoyed this show as much as I did. Uh, Gunnar Monson, I hope, is okay <laughs> and not <laughs> dying here. <laughs> yeah, I got but, uh, yeah, It's one of those unfortunate show. things. Yeah, that I... <laughs> I was I was I was having it not a heart attack but uh, coughing my head off so <laughs> uh, pretty given but uh, we'll definitely <laughs> we'll definitely have have David back on the show soon I uh, truly uh, looking forward to uh, meeting up with him in September at the conference and, and getting a chance to listen to him in person so uh, fantastic stuff well and thank you everybody for joining us yeah. this Sunday on on Monster X Radio and we'll be back next weekend next Sunday with a brand new episode. And remember, go to our brand new website, www.monsterxradio.com and uh, subscribe today and we keep uh, keep you in the loop. So, uh, 
Uh, thanks again to our guests, and we will be back next Sunday. Thanks, everybody, and have a great week. guy knows more isn't always better unless we're talking about full-size vans these beasts do more than get you from a to b they have so much space a man can live in it with shag carpeting water bed and a sweet lava lamp these mobile abodes have all the comforts of home with quality parts and plenty of napa know-how you can keep the original tiny house running longer stronger that's napa know-how napa know-how